Yo, greetings ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another iceberg video by yours truly. Today we're going to be covering the subliminal message iceberg created by Reddit user Semidios. In case you're not familiar, subliminal messages are basically a type of message that can show up like this. Something that quickly shows up or lingers in the background of images, videos, maybe it's the sounds and music. It could be anything and be for anything really. They are a form of sensory stimuli. Uh, that is a stimuli that happens below an individual's threshold of conscious perception. Or in other words, subliminal messages are often used as a means of subconsciously relaying a message, feeling, or idea to the viewer or listener without them fully being aware of it. Based on that premise, you can probably imagine that this could be used for insidious purposes by even more insidious people. But it may also be used in an artistic sense to further add to a piece. Or in many cases, it could also be absolutely nothing and people are just seeing things that aren't really there because they are actively looking for something that is off. I guess I should note that immediately here at the front that subliminal messages are kind of one of those weird pseudoscience things that in some studies seem to be something that is used in a tangible real way and in other ways seems to be something that is completely false and has no bearing on reality or your perception at all. It's going to be kind of a case by case basis with these supposed subliminal messages. Uh, but luckily for you, this iceberg will showcase various examples of supposed subliminal messages. From the most well known and kind of silly at times, to the most obscure and in some cases quite disturbing, from the elaborate hoax to the real time application and the enormous sea of vague terminology that lies in between. But with all that said, sit back, relax, and let's fall into our subconscious and see the world through a different lens. Tostitos logo. So first off, we have a pretty basic subliminal message. Tostitos is a brand of tortilla chips that you usually would pair with salsa or nacho cheese dip. Well, right here on the logo, the red dot for the letter I is actually meant to be a bowl of salsa, and the two T's are meant to be people and the yellow triangle above them a chip. Thus, the message is clear. This chip is good for sharing with others and dipping in salsa. Maybe even a Tostito branded salsa? Yeah, it's pretty basic, honestly. It was something that I figured out as a kid, in fact, so it's not all that subliminal now, is it? More so just basic logo design, if you ask me. Wendy's Mom. This one is also pretty simple and centers around the Wendy's fast food chain's logo. You see, many have pointed out that the fold in the Wendy girl's collar looks a lot like it spells out the word mom, and that this is supposed to be a subliminal message. The Wendy's burgers, chili, and nuggies taste like your mom's cooking. However, according to the Wendy's company, this is unintentional and is not meant to be a subliminal message of any kind. Though, uh, to be fair, technically if it was a subliminal message, I'm not even really sure if they would, you know, admit to that. The whole idea of a subliminal message is something that's meant to be, well, subliminal. You're not supposed to consciously be aware of it. But regardless, it's still just probably a mere coincidence. 
Pepsi vs. Coca-Cola Halloween ad. This one refers to a 2013 Halloween ad where Pepsi had a Pepsi can dressed in a Coca-Cola cape with the caption of, We wish you a scary Halloween. The subliminal message I guess being that Pepsi disguising itself as a Coke is scary because Pepsi is better than Coke and it's pretending to be a Coke, which is scary. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know why this one is considered a subliminal message. It seems like a pretty basic company versus company thing. A basic little dig, you know? A Sega does what Nintendo don't type of thing. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Hidden Mickeys and Pirates of the Caribbean. In the Pirates of the Caribbean film franchise, there are several moments throughout that series where these hidden Mickey Mouses can be found as shown here. The only thing about this one is again, I don't think this one is actually a subliminal message. Message, and it's more so an easter egg found throughout the series. Sort of like how you can see a picture of Mario in that one window of Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I suppose it can be a bit of a thin line between those two things in film, but then what would the subliminal message be here? Wash and buy Disney movies? Support Disney company? Buy Disney product? Well, you're kind of already doing that by watching this film, so it seems like a pretty useless message if that was really the case. I mean, I suppose it can still be a subliminal message even if it's kind of an obvious thing, but then honestly the more I thought about it, the more I feel like it actually is rather difficult with this particular topic to separate easter egg from subliminal message. Since they both are supposed to be hidden details, your brain or eyes wouldn't immediately pick up on. But generally subliminal messages have a more manipulative context, trying to subliminally influence people's opinions, future purchases, etc. Whereas easter eggs are more so something that is meant to be hidden, but eventually found by observant watchers or players, etc. It is why they're called easter eggs after all. They're purposely placed there for you to eventually find, even if it's a little difficult to find them at first glance. While in contrast, subliminal messages, at least in most contexts, seem to be hidden because they don't want you to find them, but instead subliminally pick up on them. But then, in an artistic sense, there are several subliminal messages that are come up in this iceberg later on that were indeed a subliminal thing that's like flashes on screen for just a split second that was meant to subliminally infer a feeling onto the audience, but also was not necessarily meant to not eventually be found, I suppose with time. I don't want to go on and on, but I only bring this up because it's a complex and interesting conversation that I don't want to spend time every single entry bringing up but I figured I'd at least note the difference slash the general ideas of these things and how they can get confused and crisscrossed very often. Hidden Aliens in South Park. So this one's actually pretty interesting despite it being yet again something I'd argue is closer to an Easter egg. In quite a few South Park episodes, you can see hidden aliens in the background. Sometimes being amongst a crowd of people, sometimes being well hidden in the background, sometimes being a tattoo on a guy's head, they really are everywhere, it would seem. What's interesting though is many fans have debated over if there's actually a hidden alien in every single episode of the show ever made, and that they just simply haven't found all of them yet, or if they were just in the ones that they have found thus far. Either way, it's been a long running gag by the creators and when asked about these hidden aliens and if they were in every single episode, the general answer they gave was that they don't remember. But it seems like the answer is no. Either way though, hidden aliens can still be found in the backgrounds and details of South Park episodes even to this day, existing as something for longtime fans to continue searching for and documenting online. Lion King S.E.X. So this is the one that I think almost goes without saying. It's one of the most famous incidents of a supposed subliminal message that caught the world by storm. In fact, this one is so pervasive that it seems every few years it's brought up all over again and people are yet again surprised and uh, maybe at times appalled by the supposed idea of it. 
I actually remember back in the day when I first heard about this supposed subliminal message. In fact, it was kind of one of the first ones that introduced me uh, to the idea. It was from one of those old conspiracy theory slash subliminal message YouTube videos and channels from like 2007 to 2008 or so that usually always opened up like this. <laughs> or like this. Glorious, wonderful times, truly. Man, that shit blew my mind at the time. But then I kind of started noticing that those same YouTubers who were making those videos also seemed to be a wee bit crazy. <laughs> so I, I eventually kind of dismissed the entire idea uh, after seeing the other stuff that these people seem to have believed in. But anyway, the message is supposedly written here when Simba lays down with a thud on this cliffside. And while at first glance, especially when you have this red lettering on top of it, it does look like it says that. Though this has been denied by Disney and pretty much everyone involved in the creation of The Lion King. And in fact, it even later came out that it was actually an easter egg of sorts. It was actually a nod to the SFX team. Thus, it actually spelled SFX and not SEX. But due to the pure scope and virality of this subliminal message, it took a while for many to not only accept and understand the factual information about the uh, dust from the cliffside. Kind of in a similar fashion to how everyone thought the Lion King ripped off Kimba the White Lion until YMS actually did the research as well as watched Kimba and found that that was just not the fucking case at all. But I have a feeling people will still be telling this old urban legend about it being SEX for years to come. Because I guess it's pretty scandalous that one of the greatest animated films of all time has the word SEX written in it. Well, I mean, it's that and also the fact that journalists keep bringing it back up as if it were a fact because they're lazy and they have no integrity. But nonetheless, this supposed message started a wildfire of people trying to find subliminal messages or hidden secrets in other famous animated Disney films as well to find out what other naughty or sinister things Disney is hiding within their animated films. Which, speaking of... Little Mermaid Castle. So this one's about the time Disney put a solid gold schlong in the Little Mermaid's VHS cover. Now, in case you're wondering where it's supposed to be, it's right here. Now, what's interesting about this one is seemingly everyone and their mother saw this castle spire slash tower as a dick. And so stories started going around that this was made this way to subliminally introduce sex to, well, young kids. In particular, girls. There was also a rumor about this golden rod being painted on last second by a disgruntled employee over at Disney since he heard he was going to get laid off at work soon. This however is all just simply urban legend and myth and is not at all the case. In fact, the artist who made this cover would later be interviewed, and he didn't even work for Disney. It was apparently a bit of a rush job. The infamous Spire was just purely made that way by accident. This was also the cover that was on all the old movie theater posters and promotional material, such as lunchboxes and the like. So this went unnoticed for quite a while until according to some articles written about this controversy at the time, Michelle Coach of Mesa, Arizona, complained to Disney and a Phoenix supermarket chain about the supposed scepter on the VHS box. 
This would lead to a 24 hour recall of the VHS to an altered version without the spire, and thus the media went crazy with the story. Funny enough though, I actually own a copy of the original VHS cover. <laughs> yeah, I know, I am pretty cool. But if you ask me, I think people just had a little bit too much time on their hands staring at the VHS box cover. It may be a bit too dirty of an imagination. After all, all the other spires also kind of have that shape to it. But at any rate, we're not quite done with the topic of the Little Mermaid, nor are we done talking about Ding Dongs just yet. Little Mermaid Priest. Something about the Little Mermaid just attracts this certain kind of... A controversy. Though this one, this one's a little bit more suspect. During the wedding scene before the finale of the film, we see this little priest, and as he's talking to the false bride and groom to be, he's got a little something under his robe. But I mean, maybe it's just a weird knee or. Hello, beloved. Oh, it, it grew. Yeah, this looked an awful lot like this minister was a little too excited to be at the ceremony. However, this is one of those things that looks really, really bad if you only see it from this one shot. Because while it may be hard to believe, this is indeed the guy's knees. As while it's hard to see from this angle, if you look at it from this angle for instance, suddenly it becomes a fair bit more clear that this is the character's knees. Still, this didn't stop people from claiming that this was yet another case of Disney subliminally pushing sex onto young viewers. And we showcased this clear evidence back in the day alongside the Lion King SEX thing. Now, I will say that even though this is supposed to be his knees, it does look like the animators might have gotten a bit cheeky here. Because at this angle, it's, well, I don't know how you spend hours animating that and not see that it looks like something else. If it wasn't meant to look like what it looks like, you think one of the animators would have pointed this out at some point during the production. Still, there is plausible deniability here, and frankly, I don't think even if it was meant to be a naughty little joke, that it was done so to subliminally say something to children. I guess, truth be told, you can't really know anyone's motives when it comes to this sort of stuff, so maybe it was completely by accident and no one saw that this looked weird, or it was done on purpose and was meant to be a sly little fucking joke that they snuck into the movie, probably for the lulls, if nothing else, or it was purposely put there to subliminally introduce uh, sexual content to young viewers. I suppose you can take your pick, which you believe is the most likely. But either way, the problem lump would later be removed in all future releases of the film on home video, DVD, Blu-ray, and the like. Woman in the Lion King poster. Ah, uh, yet another movie poster debacle. Many have looked at this Lion King poster and thought, huh, that looks like ass. But not like ass as in it sucks, but ass as in, oh, you get the point. Again, a consistent theme here of Disney supposedly subliminally showing something sexual in nature with their products aimed at all ages. Is this more evidence towards the growing list of examples that Disney back in the 90s were trying to subliminally communicate sexual imagery or language onto young viewers? Or was it just simply yet another misunderstanding made by someone who was looking at the poster for far too long? I'll leave that for you to decide. Minnie's Clothes. You see this Disney gift card? Well, looking at it, you probably- Giant blue cock. That is all. The Rescuer's Topless Woman. I promise this whole iceberg won't all be Disney related stuff, but they hold pretty much all the most popular supposed subliminal messages and, well, pretty much this entire second tier is pretty much the uh, Disney tier. However, unlike the other ones shown thus far, where there could be some kind of uh, simple explanation, or they just turned out to not be true, or it was just a work of a dirty mind staring at a picture for too long, this one is actually 100% real. On the 8th of January 1999, Disney announced a recall of the home video version of their 1977 animated feature, The Rescuers, because it contained an quote-unquote objectionable background image. It appears about 38 minutes into the film, and only for a few frames, and while I obviously can't show you it here on YouTube, I think you get the point. 
Disney claims that none of their animators put this frame into the film and that it was inserted during the post-production process. Disney recalled the VHS tapes and provided a new cut with the frames cleaned up. But as you might imagine, this did not help Disney's case at the time as the whole family friendly aspect of their brand was far more important to them back then than it is now. And it was perhaps this very fact that made it so enticing for others to look at what dark secrets they could be hiding. Though in this particular case, Disney's decision to recall all these tapes was more interesting because unlike the other times where people had gone digging for something, it seems Disney themselves caught this and recalled it, making the information about it suddenly much more widely known. Many have wondered why they would bother if it had gone unnoticed for over 20 years. Why give so much attention to it by announcing the recall so now everyone knows about it? Well, I personally think it had to do with the fact that people were looking for this stuff now. But the thing is, this was a case where the image being there was simply undeniable. It wasn't a subliminal message so much as it was a subliminal image right there in your face if you pause the frame. And while it was probably put there by some cheeky lad who thought it was funny, if if you were to look at it from the angle of it being a subliminal message aimed at kids, well, had one of those people that were kind of going with that train of thought at the time had found it first, this would have been pretty compelling evidence for their entire viewpoint and argument. In fact, I wouldn't think it would be all that crazy during this time that with all this subliminal message shit that was being spread around at the time, Disney might have been looking extremely closely at all their VHS tapes and basically anything regarding their animated films at the time to make extra sure there wasn't anything hidden in there by one of the animators or editors, etc. Skulls and Gaston's Eyes. This one is just super cool. Um, spoilers for Beauty and the Beast, if for some reason you've never seen it, I guess. In the finale of the film, the Beast and Gaston fight it out on the rooftops of the castle. And then Gaston stabs the Beast while he's hanging off of an edge. A move that very much leads to his uh, downfall. If you pause just as he's falling to his death, for two frames you can see a skull and crossbones in his eyes. This being a subliminal message that implies that he was staring death in the face. You know, if you didn't already catch that by the really, really long fall. Anyway, I think it's just a pretty cool little feature of this scene that you more than likely won't notice until someone has pointed it out to you. Demon Hand Sign in Disney Films. So this one is very interesting because it's one that supposedly spans across multiple films. The basic idea is that in many Disney films you can see various characters making this gesture with their hands, which in case you're not familiar, is a hand symbol often associated with the worship of the devil or Levian Satanism. It's not just for that, mind you. It does have ties to other religions and in recent years can be considered a general hand gesture for being rebellious and what have you. That being said, while it's not actually listed here on the iceberg, this idea that Disney is subliminally endorsing the devil or a general evil and imparting that message onto children is a rabbit hole that goes far, far, far deeper than just these hand gestures. For example, you have the Walt Disney logo itself, which many have pointed out is kind of strange looking for a signature. And well, it just so happens to look like there's three sixes in the signature. Again, the number 666 often being associated as the number of the beast or Satan slash evil in a broad sense. This goes further with again connecting to the sexual imagery and wording being another asset of this subliminal messaging. And the furthermore you realize how many times people have found the word sex or genitalia in the background of these Disney films. Then when you connect it with the fact that Walt Disney himself was supposedly a Freemason, or at least it is often suspected that he was, and then you can connect Freemason slash Illuminati imagery to the whole thing. While I don't really agree with the video in question, a video I saw nearly everyone who had something to say about this topic take screenshots from was this 2014 video entitled Disney equals 666, which showcases a lot of the examples I showed 
episode here of the supposed subliminal messages. Take, for example, Walt Disney, right? And many people that will preach against the TV, they'll preach against the movies, they'll preach against Hollywood because it's obvious that that stuff is bad. But then they'll say, well, well we watch Disney movies and lined up and they have their kids watching those movies all day long. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to prove to you right now that those movies are wicked. Subliminal messages. Now, we're ta what are we talking about tonight? Sorcery. What are we talking about tonight? Uh, getting inside your mind and messing with you. Uh, controlling your thought process by, by uh, supernatural means or demonic means. Or Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Disney movies are filled with subliminal messages. Okay, all throughout the movie, there are pornographic pictures hidden in the movie. Like you'll be watching the movie and just for a few seconds, something filthy will come on. Now, what do I think of all this? Well, I honestly feel like I only scratched the surface of this rabbit hole, and it would honestly make an interesting video in its own right discussing it more. That being said, like many of these others we've seen thus far, and I'm sure that we're going to see in the future of this iceberg, it's going to be kind of up to the viewer to decide what they think is true or not if it's not blatantly clear. Is Disney one of the most powerful companies in the world? also trying to indoctrinate children with subliminal or even basic messages in their films? Or are all of these things just coincidences found by people looking too hard at the films? Is this a dark truth being unveiled or just people looking for evidence that's not there? Is this a clever way of having the mark of the beast on every single piece of media and merchandise Disney produces? Or is it just a weird signature? Are all these characters subtly showing the hand symbol of the devil? Or were the animators just trying to do something interesting with the character's fingers? I'd say that the whole dark conspiracy thing is uh, pretty unlikely. Maybe besides Scar, he's totally indoctrinating children. But it's a disturbing idea all the same. And I think it actually connects with an even greater conspiracy theory slash fact that will slowly unfold as we progress through this iceberg. So I'll save that for later, but just keep in the back of your mind that there is a much deeper, much more real fear that the idea of subliminal messages taps into. You are now under my control. Your mind is mine. Okay, this is the last one connected with Disney, I promise. For a while, anyway. This one's about this song in the show Gravity Falls, where this character Robbie steals this one song that has subliminal messaging in it to brainwash this other character, Wendy, into falling in love with him. Something that the other characters of the show find out by playing the song backwards. This is a literal subliminal message being used as a plot device in the show, though it should be noted that Gravity Falls plays with the idea of subliminally messaging the viewer as well as laying out hints for the viewer to find to uncover its mystery that surrounds and alludes to its primary villain. So this is a case where subliminal messages are used in a creative artistic sense, I suppose. KFC Hidden Dollar. This entry is about how in a KFC commercial, one that was advertising the KFC snacker that was being sold for a dollar, has a dollar hidden inside the lettuce of the commercial as seen here by this low quality video from back in 2008. See, huh? Hey, I uh, found a dollar in your couch. You fit? You sure? It's a dollar. It won't get me anything these days. You can turn that dollar into a KFC snacker. What? The snacker's only 99 cents. It comes in buffalo. Honey barbecue? Mm. Ultimate cheese. Mm. Today, I am a wealthy man. There's no evidence that you're wealthy. Mm. Well, there's no evidence that you're wealthy. Mm. Well, there's no evidence that you're wealthy. Mm. Big taste, big variety, small coin. The 99 cent snacker is a... This is kind of a really easy one to spot as well, but all the same, I guess the subliminal message here is to use your $1 bills to buy this chicken sandwich. 
However, there is a bit more to this one, as the reason it was so easy to spot was because it was meant to be found by those who were watching their commercials closely. The first few to find it would then get free coupons for the new sandwich if they called in to their KFC or whatever, all of which was utilized to put more attention on their commercials, and thus their brand, and thus get them more money. Ironically, doing the very thing a supposed subliminal message would do through a simple advertising campaign. Bear in Toplerone logo. Yes indeed, hidden in the details of the mountain on the oh so popular candy bar logo is a bear. This bear apparently is in reference to the city of Bern, um, since a bear features on its coat of arms. Bern being the Swiss capital and place of origin for the candy bar. Again, not sure what the subliminal message is, just because the logo has a deeper meaning doesn't mean it's a subliminal message unless I'm missing something here. Enderman sounds backwards. First one based around a video game. In Minecraft, there are these enemies called Endermen, based loosely around the creepypasta concept of Slenderman. And they make these weird noises. And if you play these sounds backwards, they actually sound like they're saying, hi, hello, and what's up? Uh, the Endermen subliminally greeting you, you might say. <laughs> I've also read that they apparently say thank you in reverse when you defeat the Ender Dragon, so uh, that's pretty cool. SFX Magazine I feel like I could just put up a few screenshots on the screen, and you guys can probably tell what the subliminal message is. You, uh, you picking up on it yet? Yeah, SFX is apparently a sci-fi slash fantasy slash horror in general uh, pop culture magazine. They seem to be one of the many magazines under the Games Radar umbrella of magazines, and uh, they frequently make the F look like it's an E on their covers. And frankly, by simply the sheer number of examples of them doing this, I'd wager this was very much an intentional design choice from the magazine's inception. A sort of baked-in subliminal message, I suppose. Jessica Rabbit's Privates. This one's also rather famous. In the banger 1988 live-action meets animation mystery film titled Who Framed Roger Rabbit, there's this one character named Jessica Rabbit, and, well, yeah, she's meant to be an animated sex symbol. And the film is pretty meta about that as well. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. Well, as this entry suggests, the animators might have enjoyed drawing her just a little too much. There's this one scene where she goes flying out of a car and her dress hikes up and it appears for only a few frames that she's wearing, well, nothing under there. This was actually discovered back in the day via the laser disc release of the film where you could go frame by frame in the films really easily. This has since been edited out in all future releases, mind you, and there has also been some debate over if this was really meant to be her underwear, or if there was a coloration error, or if it was fully intentional. Uh, but whatever, uh, make of that what you will. Silence of the Lambs poster. Silence of the Lambs, an all-time best as far as horror films go, and like many in those ranks, it has an eye-catching poster. It features the protagonist of the film, Clarice, with a moth over her mouth, something which is tied to the themes and general storyline and serial killer to which she is trying to catch within the film. Many might be quick to notice that this moth has what looks to be a skull on it, which is already a pretty cool and ominous design, but that isn't the subliminal message, or even the true hidden feature. Instead, it's actually what the skull is made up of. While I do have to blur it a bit here, this is a group of nude women, all huddled up together in a frankly disturbing fashion to make up this skull. This once again not only ties into the film, but also as a subliminal message, I suppose, that ties into the sexual themes of the film. I would go into more detail, but a full description of the film and its twist would need to be done to do so. So, needless to say, a bunch of women's bodies being used to make up a whole new image very much connects to the film and its villain, Buffalo Bill. 
Facebook sign-up page. So, the Facebook sign-up page looks like this. At least, it did. I'm not going to go to Facebook to figure out if they changed it since then. Uh, but anyway, some have noticed that the lines that represent people connecting with one another seem to spell out the word S-E-X. Which is kind of interesting, if intentional, since, I mean, I suppose sex is an important thing that connects us all. And in the context of Facebook, you might say that Facebook is sort of propping itself up to be of the same importance. Facebook being the place where you create life. Uh, your life, that is. But then again, some have also noted that you can also spell out the letters to be KFC with these lines. So, uh, who really knows? I wouldn't put it past Mark Fishmanberg to put some kind of subliminal message on the front page of his site. Uh, but then again, maybe it's just a simple coincidence and these are just a bunch of fucking lines. Yvan et Niage. This entry is in reference to the Simpsons episode where there is a music video that is being used to recruit people to the Navy through both the lyrics, Yvan et Niage, being join the Navy backwards, and there being an actual pop-up message of Uncle Sam saying that he wants you to enlist yourself into the Navy now for a whole frame. This being another case of subliminal messages being used as a plot point. James Sunderland looking at the player. In the opening cutscene of one of the greatest horror games, hell, one of the greatest games ever created, Silent Hill, the protagonist James Sunderland does the following. It's a moody opening cutscene that is followed by an even moodier set of scenes. However, what is interesting about this cutscene is James has his eyes cast in shadow as he looks into his reflection. Well, that is until you turn up the lights of this picture and can fully see his eyes, which reveals something rather strange. That he is not looking at himself, but instead, you, the player. This is pretty creepy since Silent Hill 2 is a game full of symbolism, various serious themes, etc. In fact, you could make a whole iceberg about Silent Hill 2 alone, honestly. Many have wondered if this staring at the audience means something deeper symbolically, or if it's something that means absolutely nothing since you normally can't and aren't allowed to see his eyes on a normal playthrough of the game. But either way, it's an interesting fact all the same. Headcrab's noises backwards. If you're familiar with Half-Life 2, you probably are already well aware of head crabs. But those who aren't, head crabs are parasitic alien organisms that look like this, have an underbelly that looks like this, and are well known for attaching themselves to human skulls and digging their beaks deep into their skull, turning them into their zombie-like slaves. This is already creepy enough of a concept, but it becomes far worse when you hear the terrible sound that the victims of these awful creatures make as they hobble around and over to you, ready to kill. Now this already sounds like a creature in immense pain and suffering. But it's when you reverse the audio that the true screams of terror can be heard. Yeah, I'm pretty disturbing. Monsters Inc. Uncle Roger. So, spoilers for the Monsters, Inc. film if you haven't seen it already. This subliminal message is in reference to a old YouTube video which has since been deleted from the platform, which showcases at the very end of the film of Monsters, Inc. when Sully walks into the room of Boo, the two getting ready to be reunited, I suppose, and this appears on the wall. Now, this is 100% a hoax, though it is a pretty well-edited one, 
as the original image was created by Corey Vaspasiano for a digital editing contest for the website Crack, in which users were asked to insert R-rated Easter eggs into children's movies. Later, whoever was the person to make this original video, I suppose, wanted to pull a little prank on everyone and made the video acting as if it was yet another dark subliminal message left behind by Disney slash Pixar to indoctrinate children's minds. But as you can see in the actual film, this is a completely different drawing. Though, while we're on the topic of this, Bonus Entry, The Wizard of Oz, Hanging Munchkin. This is one of those certified classic urban legends slash hidden details in the background type things that seem to never really die out. The story goes that one of the actors playing one of the munchkins was heartbroken by one of the others breaking up with him. And so he got himself set up on a ladder and got a rope, I suppose, and then hung himself via the rope. And then the legend goes that this can actually be seen in the background of this scene. Note that I will be uh, putting some filters and audio shit so this video doesn't get copyright striked. Now the funny thing is, what probably started this urban legend is that it's actually a bit hard to see what is in the background here due to the quality of most VHS tapes. And since that was the way most would check up on this myth, Back in the day when it first started circulating, there was some question as to what this background detail was. However, this is not the case when seen on a much higher quality television. Did I get you with that one? All right, no more fooling around. This is what the actual scene looks like. And as you can see, it's clearly just the fucking bird in the background. The one I just showed you before is from a viral video that is edited and meant to fool people, which it actually did a pretty good job of doing. And it spread the urban legend around a hell of a lot more since most people were uh, very likely to see this footage, especially when the urban legend later evolved to say that in the later Blu-ray releases, they digitally edited the hanging man out. And so you have to have this specific VHS in order to see the true hanging munchkin. And then as well, any of the cast members and the like that are saying it was always a bird are all covering up the grand conspiracy and truth. Which, considering how fucked up nearly everyone involved in the making and acting of this film ended up, I'd uh, recommend Implement's video on the topic for a really good documentary on it. This was quite the devilish and believable bit of trolling, really adding to the myth. That said, there are some really good videos on YouTube that uh, take time breaking down, even showing all the digital effects that were used in order to fool people into believing that this was real. And even though it's fake, I think it's one of the more interesting and believable creepy pasta type stories to come from this space. Mind you, this isn't so much of a subliminal message, but uh, when else was I going to bring this up? The Exorcist Captain Howdy. Now this is actually a very creepy and very real subliminal message used in the famous supernatural horror film The Exorcist. For those unaware, in the film, little girl Reagan gets possessed by a demon known as Pazuzu, or Captain Howdy as Reagan describes them. Well, director William Friedkin really wanted to use everything he could to unnerve the audience, and this included several times throughout the film, for about an eighth of a second, the face of the demon possessing Reagan would show up on the screen. It's a pretty creepy way of subliminally unnerving the audience, which maybe had some real effect considering how fucking crazy people were about this film uh, terrifying them at the time. People were calling this the scariest film of all time, and people were literally fainting and leaving the theaters in droves and going through all sorts of crazy uh, mass hysteria-like behavior about this film uh, back when it first came out. Personally though, I think there is much more scary films out there, and I think The Exorcist overall has been rather overhyped. 
But all the same, this impact cannot be denied, and it is still a pretty damn good film overall. Subliminal Demon Face included. The Beatles Revolution 9 Turn Me On Dead Man. So this one is kind of weird and it's going to be very difficult to showcase here in this video, uh, sadly due to how strict YouTube is with uh, showing music. But I will have a link down below in the description for those who want to listen to the song I'm discussing as well as the supposed subliminal message. Now this all starts with a song titled Revolution 9 from the Beatles White Album, which opens with a British voice saying the number nine, number nine, several times before a cacophony of other creepy and strange sounds, a backward sounding music, and just generally an eerie soundscape continues to play on for eight minutes. It's honestly a fucking trip, and even if you're familiar with the Beatles' sound, even their more experimental songs, this is eight minutes of pure fucking chaos, which left many people wondering what the fuck that track was about. Well, some fans eventually tried playing this song on backwards, and the repeated phrase, number nine, sounded a lot like the phrase, turn me on dead man when reversed. Now, this is already interesting enough, but then apparently a conspiracy theory started springing up from there, somewhere that this phrase was meant to symbolize Paul McCartney of the Beatles being dead. Now, I don't really understand how one jumps from the song being creepy and uh, the number nine sounding like Turn Me On Dead Man to Paul McCartney is dead. And sadly, uh, from my research, I couldn't find any source that stated what the connection was there. So if you do happen to know for sure what it is, then let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I guess it's just a rather strange jump in logic. At any rate, the conspiracy goes on to say that this song was meant to not only symbolize Paul McCartney being dead, but also that he was replaced with a look-alike that was unfortunately never able to produce the same quality of songs as the original. And while all of this just seems like a grand fucking LARP at this point, again, yet another jump in logic having taken place, that I don't even really think is worth deeply analyzing. Something connected to this topic I found was rather interesting though. The idea of reverse music not only holding subliminal messages, but the grander idea of reverse speech holding some a greater truth about people's intentions. Let me break it down like this. There are some that hold the opinion that reverse speech has been used to relay subliminal messages to audiences, be it by the artist of the song, a big corporation, the government, or what have you. I think you kind of get the general idea of this concept, and there are countless examples out there of claims that certain songs have double meanings. Then you have yet another asset of this theory that proposes that these messages might not actually be intentional, but rather a subliminal voice of sorts that comes from a person's true self, or perhaps their shadow to put it in Jungian terms. The theory then goes on to say that if you reverse any one person's speech, words, music, etc., and listen to what words and phrases come through that this is reflective of their true intentions, ideas, feelings, personality, etc. This is kind of a weirdly fun theory if only because you can apply it towards a literally anything. Even this video right now, you could clip this exact section and reverse it and try and see what my uh, uh, in true intentions are, I guess. And broadly, this is used to try and find the dark truth behind a person's thoughts, which I suppose can lead to even more dark and crazy conspiracy theories from there. However, we're still not done, because then you have a more scientific answer, that we as humans try our best to sound out and correct speech in our heads. It's kind of a natural thing, so when we hear words reversed, our brains can't help but to try and make sense of them. 
them, even if it is complete nonsense. Which is interesting because then if you apply the past theory to this much more logical answer to this phenomenon, one could argue that the words that you personally hear in the reverse speech and songs may actually reveal more about you and your own thoughts than they do the person or song that you're listening to. Since it is your brain and your, I guess, critical thinking that is breaking down and creating words out of literal nonsense. Really making this whole idea come full circle. Anyway, I just wanted to bring this all up. If you ever want to have a ton of fun, uh, try looking up your favorite songs backwards and try and make sense of them. Be sure to go and check in the comments down below and see how wild people's theories go with it as well. Coca-Cola in Lord of the Rings. This one seems to be tied to a particular video that's still on YouTube called Lord of the Rings Subliminal Message from 2009, which seems to show the one ring of power that normally has the language of Mordor written on it and instead has what is clearly written as Coca-Cola on it. This is of course fake. You can see the real scene here and clearly see that it doesn't have that. But I will say it is a bit funny that someone thought that the curvy letters of Mordor looked similar enough to the uh, design language of the Coca-Cola logo. Slow paced music in supermarkets. So this one is about the practice of many supermarkets playing ambient or slower paced music as a means of getting shoppers to relax and be more comfortable with spending more money. Though it does go a bit deeper than that. There was one study done in a wine shop for example that found that customers were more likely to buy French wines when French style music was playing in the shop and uh, the vice versa when German style music was playing in the same shop. When these same customers were asked about this, they found that the music hadn't even really been a factor in their decision making, despite this apparent difference, which would imply, at least in this small sample size, that the music has some sort of subliminal effect on their purchasing decisions. Or maybe it was just a happy coincidence. In another study in 1982 done by Millimans, it was found that shoppers walked more quickly through a shop when fast paced music was played, which gave customers less time to observe all the shelves and impulse buy. Conversely, slow tempo music had the opposite effect. It slowed customers down as they shopped and people purchased more during their visit. As a result, significantly higher daily profits were earned by the supermarket simply by playing slower background music in the shop. This can run even deeper, like how classical music was found to have people purchase more expensive items, or how playing unfamiliar music often helped in subliminal effect rather than a song that they're familiar with playing, since if they are more familiar with the song, it often made the customer pay more attention to the song rather than the stuff on the shelves. But this has a rather long history of studies, and it all generally leads to the idea that softer, more ambient music can possibly have an effect on certain people going more slowly and thus buying more items. This actually gets kind of interesting when you apply it to art as well, because then you could argue that certain music choices in say a YouTube video or a film or a video game have a subliminal or psychological effect on the viewer or player, whether it be a relaxing effect or a um, intensifying effect or what have you, which I guess is just kind of generally true. This is probably the most common and realistic use case of a, a subliminal effect on one's mind. But then if you're someone like me who always hyper focuses on the music in the background of film and video games and the like, I wonder if it is truly a subliminal thing at that point then. It definitely has a psychological effect, like it's like, wow, I really like this song and it fits really well with this scene, if you know what I mean, uh, but I am consciously aware of it. Uh, but I suppose regardless, this is just going more so into uh, the, the sensation that music gives us as people. Um, so I'll probably move on from here. But it is an interesting topic all the same. Bonus entry, Patrick eats sperm. 
This entry was suggested by someone from my Discord server. It's once again one of those subliminal messages that is a connected to a really old ass video on YouTube. This one having been released on December 31st of 2007, entitled Spongebob Patrick Saying Eat Sperm, which I shall now play a clip from. And yeah, I I don't think that's what he is saying in that scene. But nonetheless, this is one of those classics. It has nearly 5 million views on YouTube and was worth bringing up since uh, there were a lot of urban legends slash subliminal messages that uh, many people tried to put onto the SpongeBob SquarePants show since again, it's a really popular children's show. It had a big cultural impact like Disney. So of course, uh, many would look into the show, its backgrounds and etc to try to find uh, things that were amiss. Uh, but this uh, iceberg doesn't really cover anything Spongebob related, so uh, count this as a general entry for it. The Departed Exes Directed by Martin Scorsese, The Departed is a 2006 crime thriller film. And without giving away too many spoilers, throughout the film, exes can be found all over the place, in the background, in the foreground, uh, basically everywhere, and they are always meant to symbolize, well, chiefly death. Anytime a villain or a criminal dies in the film, an X can be seen there foreshadowing the event. But so too does it symbolize the death of the good characters as well, the X being a visual signifier for their fate regardless. This is actually a bit of a callback to Howard Hawks' 1932 film Scarface, uh, the original that Brian De Palma eventually would remake with Al Pacino in 1983. Hawks uses the shape throughout the film to symbolize that living a life as a gangster means to live a life as a marked man. Thus, the axe is used to once again foreshadow death. This is also something that can be seen in the all-time mobster classic The Godfather, but instead of X's, it's oranges. Anytime oranges can be seen on screen, or in some cases the color orange, it is there to symbolize that death is in the air. This is also just something that can be broken down as another a tool in a filmmaker's bag of visual tricks as you really can have any shape, object, person, color, a camera angle, etc. symbolize nearly anything you want if you're consistent enough with it. This does kind of yet again beg the question what the core difference between a, a supposed subliminal message is from visual symbolism, as nearly every film ever made has some form of symbolism. It's visual language, even if it's as simple as something like a, a character's design or outfit, the lighting, the camera angle, etc. And again, is compounded when you add music and non-diegetic elements into it as well. Kirby Dreamland 2 Naked Lady In Kirby's Dreamland 2 on the original Game Boy, one of the secret areas in level 5 when zoomed out all the way looks quite a bit like a crude drawing of a naked woman. Nintendo has never confirmed nor denied this mind you, but I think it's pretty obvious what it's supposed to be regardless. Marlboro's F1 Code this one's in reference to the F1 or Formula One racers who often have many sponsors they put on as stickers and the like on their cars, with some having cigarette companies as sponsors, which is perfectly fine and well, except for when they race in countries where advertising cigarettes is illegal, in which case they often have to find solutions around this problem in said countries. One such example of this is by simply putting barcodes in place of the brand names. And in this case, the famed Scuderia Ferrari was accused of having a barcode that was using subliminal messaging to suggest the brand they're sponsored by, that being Marlboro. Many claim that the barcode on the F10 resembles the cigarette packaging of Marlboro, with it having the same color scheme. Ferrari would deny these claims, but still later on change the barcode design to be something else. Racist Intel ad. So this one's kind of, uh, well, uh, this is the ad. Multiply computing performance and maximize the power of your employees. 
This ad has a white manager standing in the middle of several African American employees working under him. Now the thing is, this ad came out in 2007, and the visual joke here was meant to be that Intel's new processors will turn every employee in your business into Olympic sprinters. Because you know, they'll be doing stuff super fast. And as you can see, all these guys are getting ready to take off running. But it also looks like a bunch of guys bowing to another guy, and given the work context, it just, well, it came off as something different, if you catch my drift. Hooker in Toy Story. Now this one just seems like a really clever visual gag more than anything. A bit of an adult joke, sure. But with that being said, in the famous Pixar film Toy Story, when Buzz Lightyear and Woody are kidnapped at Sid's house, uh, they end up seeing that he tears toys apart and then mix and matches them together into these Frankenstein-like abominations. One of which is a fishing reel with Barbie legs. Well, what does a fishing reel have? Why, a hook, of course. And this fishing rod with a hook, of course, hooks things and walks around on these female legs. Thus, you might say that it is a hooker. Yeah, you get, you, you get the joke. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Another one bites the dust. Start to smoke weed. This, like the Beatles entry earlier, is a song that has a supposed backwards message. This one being the Queen's song, Another One Bites the Dust, which if you reverse the song's titular lyric, it sounds a lot like, it's fun to smoke marijuana. But like the other one, this is yet another case of people just hearing something that isn't really there. Bush Against Gore Rats this entry is about an old political ad from the 2000 election between George Bush and Al Gore, which I'll play quickly for you. Under Clinton-Gore, prescription drug prices have skyrocketed and nothing's been done. George Bush has a plan. Add a prescription drug benefit to Medicare. Every senior will have access to prescription drug benefits. And Al Gore? Gore opposed bipartisan reform. He's pushing a big government plan that lets Washington bureaucrats interfere with what your doctors prescribe. The Gore prescription plan? Bureaucrats decide. The Bush prescription plan? Seniors choose. Now, in case you didn't see the supposed subliminal message, this is it right here. For a frame or two, the word rats is on clear display. It's actually from the word bureaucrats that's later fully shown on screen that the word drops in from. Which I suppose, given the context, is subliminally saying that the bureaucrats that they're discussing in this ad are, well, like rats. Untrustworthy, sleazy, you know, etc. This was a big deal at the time, and there are several articles and the like from back at the time uh, detailing the supposed subliminal message from basically every which angle that you can imagine depending on the news source's biases. So, you know, same as always. As for the validity of the supposed subliminal message, it's yet again one of those things that could be real, or it could be an accident. There is some plausible deniability here, but given the overall tone and that the subliminal message isn't that far off of the actual normal message of the commercial, I'd say it's at least a bit more likely to be true with this one. Even if it's just a straight up subliminal message dig at the opposition and nothing much else. But who knows. Madman666. In season 4, episode 9 of the show Mad Men, in the background of this shot, you can see the number 666 on a building in the background. Now I'm going to be frank, I know next to nothing about Mad Men, so I can't really provide any real analysis into the context of this scene, or what symbolism or message this may be inferring. But I can note that this is based on a real building, the 666 Fifth Avenue, which was very recently retitled to the 660th Fifth Avenue, which can be found in Manhattan, New York. With that context, I might say that maybe this isn't a subliminal message at all, but simply a visual indicator of where these characters are in relation to the real city of Manhattan. 
But then again, maybe Mad Men is the type of show where everything in a shot is included with an expressed purpose that runs far deeper into its themes and ideas. But if that's the case, I'm sorry to say that this is one time I can't really provide you with any uh, narrative context for it. So if there's any uh, big fans of the show, uh, be sure to comment down below if you think this has a connection to anything or if it's just a purely visual thing in the background. Hungry? Eat popcorn. So for our final entry, or at least uh, in this first half of the iceberg, we actually connect with the origin point of subliminal messaging as a marketing idea in concept generally. As per quoted by Psychology Today's article on the topic, quote, the concept of subliminal messaging took hold in the public consciousness after the 1957 publication of a book titled The Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard. In this book, Packard introduces the idea of subconscious messaging that advertisers could use to influence consumers. In the summer of 1957, James Vicari conducted an experiment on subliminal visual cues during screenings of the film Picnic. Every five seconds, Vicari flashed words like drink Coca-Cola and hungry, eat popcorn for one three thousandth of a second, which is below the threshold of conscious perception. Vicari claimed that displaying these subliminal suggestions increased Coca-Cola sales by 18.1% and caused a 57.8 jump in popcorn sales. Although the results of this study were dubious, in January of 1974, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, banned subliminal advertising from radio and television broadcasting. The official announcement by the FCC admitted that even though they weren't 100% convinced that subliminal techniques were effective, they stated whether effective or not, they were contrary to the public interest, and that any station employing subliminal messages risked losing their broadcast license." Unquote. Now what's interesting about James Vicari's results is that they turned out to be a total fucking hoax. Another thing for people to share around as an urban legend that refuses to die. However, more recent studies have suggested the subliminal cues can have small effects on one's mental state and perhaps their perception of a task, reducing one's perception of effort and increasing one's endurance to overcome something. So I guess you might say subliminal messages, like most other things, can have a small effect on our perception of reality, our outlook on a current situation. But according to all legitimate studies, they can't really get you to do something that you weren't already capable of doing. It's more like a simple nudge. The same nudge, mind you, that seeing a normal ass commercial for something is a nudge, or an inspirational quote, or just a person's suggestion. You are, after all, a human being with a free will, not a mindless robot. All of this could factor in your decision making, or maybe it won't at all. But no matter what, it is ultimately you who decides to go buy a soda or whatever else is being subliminally or overtly shown to you. Burger King, it will blow your mind away. Do I even need to say anything about this one? This ad features this woman with her mouth agape, ready to eat this seven inch meat sandwich with this caption. I think the joke is pretty clear here, although apparently the model who posed for this photo didn't know that she was doing so for this purpose, you know. Uh, for a BJ joke, which seems to have upset her a great deal, making this whole ad campaign, just like everything else from Burger King, terribly tasteless. Husker do? Get it. Alright, first one here that I've definitely never heard of before. As quoted from an article on the topic from the website The Reprobate, quote, A rare instance of a European board game being imported to the American market without a name change or any other significant changes, Husker Du, which is Danish for 
Do You Remember is a memory-based game that has proved surprisingly resilient as a format, despite seeming rather dull. Launching in the 1950s and still on sale today, the idea of remembering where images appear and then matching them is also a popular computer game format. Sold as both educational and fun, Husker Du, nevertheless, found itself in trouble in 1973, when a commercial aired during the Christmas season, which featured the words, get it, appearing in subliminal microscopic cuts. Given that the entire 60 second commercial was designed to make you want to buy the game, it's hard to see what possible difference a subliminal message link this would make, even if it worked. But nevertheless, when people became aware of it, and the problem with subliminal images is that they're never so subliminal that they can't be seen, complaints were made to the FCC and FTC. Part of the problem was that the ads appeared in children's TV slots, and no one is keen on the idea of big corporations secretly brainwashing kids. The FCC called the ads deceptive and contrary to the public interest, and they were quickly pulled. An over-enthusiastic employee was blamed for the mistake, though few believe that. Ironically, the fuss brought more publicity to the game, which might have been the idea all along. Who is to say that the subliminal message and the complaints were not all part of a carefully planned publicity stunt, unquote. This is often thought to be the first real time of a subliminal message actually being used in an attempt to subliminally get customers to buy, well, a board game. Though I wasn't actually able to find the commercial with the subliminal message in place, and I'm not actually sure if I just didn't look hard enough or if it's possibly lost media, but either way, this did apparently exist and stands as a clear case of an attempt of using this subliminal messaging to audiences. In particular, young audiences. Dodge Logo. Okay, so for this one, I feel like the whole idea is summed up in this one comparison image. Yeah, it kinda comes off as a joke, especially the whole why men are so attracted to Dodge trucks especially because it implies anything with that shape, including, I guess, a real ram's head, is subliminally attractive to men. Coca-Cola Ice Cube BJ. This entry is referring to this promotional image for Coca-Cola, with the title of Feel the Curves. And if you just so happen to look at the shapes inside the pieces of the ice, it looks kind of like, well, I think you get the point. This one is particularly interesting, at least because the title of Feel the Curves feels kind of like a sexual remark. So this one's maybe a little suspect, but as always, it could have been an accident or not. Fight Club Ding Dong. So before we even get into this one, Fight Club in general is a film that plays with subliminal imagery, in particular with Brad Pitt's character, Tyler Durden, appearing in the background of scenes before he has been formally introduced to the audience fully. Now, if you've seen the film, you know why this is the case. If not, I guess go watch the movie and find out because it's a little too complicated to go into fully here and I don't wanna spoil the movie if you haven't seen it yet. Anyway, at the very end of the film, there is a few select frames where this big old cock is shown in full frontal for all the world to see. I obviously cannot show you the frame, uh, but it's easy to search up on Google if you're that interested. This can be pretty easy to miss though, and unless you know it's there, it's sort of unlikely that you'll ever see it. But this once again ties in with the themes and ideas at play within this film. I don't really want to go into them here in this video again, but suffice to say, this isn't just a random ding dong and I suppose is meant to be a subliminal image that adds to the overall film. Again though, when it's something that you already know is there and can easily be found, it's kind of no longer subliminal anymore, is it? Funny that. Francois Mitterrand 2 
brands. So this one was hard to find much information on, as easily anyway. But from what I found, this entry seems to be referring to a subliminal message seen in the French national television daily news show as seen here. Quote, France presidential elections 1988, subliminal picture of President Francois Mitterrand appeared for several consecutive days in the title sequence of French national television daily news show, unquote. Now what's interesting is in my research to try and find information about this incident, I found a website called subliminalmanipulation.blogspot.com. Dot com, which seems to be a database made by somebody detailing subliminal messages impact on society as well as the various examples of supposed subliminal messages in just about everything that you can possibly imagine. And what was interesting about this website, besides the fact that you could probably make an entire second iceberg based around the stuff he has logged in here. He also addresses a point that I brought up at the end of part one. That being that psychologist James Vicari's tests with the whole hungry eat popcorn and drink coca-cola thing that would show up for uh, a third of a second during the movie picnic being the first time subliminal messaging was supposedly tested on the public. However, if you remember, it turned out that that entire test was a hoax and Vicari himself confessed to the results being fabricated, which would mean a whole lot of the bite, the power subliminal messaging supposedly has, would be based on a hoax. Well, as you might imagine, this is a topic that this website addresses, being that they wholesale believe in subliminal messages, and I think I'd better read their theory on this in full. Quote, In 1962, Vicari suddenly confessed that he fabricated the results of his experiment. Why would someone discredit himself in such a way and lose his dignity and credibility. Apparently, he was paid to make this announcement. As the saying goes, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. That's exactly the trick they are trying to pull, convincing the world that subliminal messaging does not work. And they did a pretty good job. People refuse to believe that the secret technology has been used on them for decades, if not more. Technology that invisibly modifies their choices, channels their new values, manages, motivates, and drives them into pathological behavior patterns in the interest of certain power structures. They will call you a wacko if you tell them anything like that. Yet subliminal messages are being bombarded at you continuously throughout the day. Through books, movies, magazines, television, radio, and music. Every major newspaper, every poster, every magazine in America have subliminal messages." Unquote. So, uh, in case you ever wondered what people who are active in this community for lack of a better term, think of this whole affair, it's yet another conspiracy theory to them. I will admit, it is pretty strange that Vicari would suddenly tell the truth if he lied about it to begin with, with such a grand scale at that. Maybe he was paid off or threatened by powerful forces. Maybe he grew a conscience and decided to come clean. Or maybe he knew the whole thing was just a big fucking hoax and knew that people were going to catch on to it eventually and decided it was best that he come clean about it first. I suppose it could be a combination of things, but either way though, it would seem his eternal reputation is to be that of a liar, one way or another. I don't want to harp on too much more of this, but I will say that reading through this website a bit, it made me realize just how far some of this shit goes. Like claiming the folds of actual people's clothing in movies in freeze frames are subliminal messages. Like. How the fuck is one meant to pull this off? It's kind of interesting looking at the world and art through these sorts of people's lenses, as it would seem that not only is everything full of subliminal messages, but most everybody is in on it. No one ever comes out of the woodwork to confirm anything though. And not only is everybody in on it and nobody is saying anything about it, but they're apparently really, really fucking good at it as well, which makes it all the more interesting the dynamic that I guess these people finding these subliminal messages must be really, really fucking good at finding them as well. It's a disturbing idea and reality, 
or state of perception to be living in. But once again, I believe it's all very much off the mark, but connects with a deeper, more real fear that once again, we'll be getting to later on. Good teenagers, take off your clothes. This entry is another Disney supposed subliminal message. Uh, this one being from the film Aladdin. And I'll just play the clip here. Leave me alone. Calm down. Calm down. So how's our little bow doing? Come on, good teenagers, take off the clothes. Down, come on, good teenagers, take off the clothes. This is one of those cases where it's already really hard to hear what he's saying here, but then when you have the caption of what they think he's saying, it's hard to unhear that. However, in the actual script for the film, Aladdin here is apparently saying, come on good kitty, take off and go. Which if you watch this scene over again and listen very closely, you can hear the take off and go part very clearly here. It is nonetheless one of those clips that just straight up sounds like a bad line delivery, or at least a rather unclear one. Alo Diabo. This entry is in reference to the Coca-Cola logo, which if you just so happen to flip it backwards, it looks like it says Alo Diablo with this little uh, squiggly line, I guess, which in Portuguese is hi devil. The subliminal message here being that uh, uh, Coca-Cola is saying hello to the little horn guy down below, I guess. Stefan Fry for Pope. As per quoted from Wikipedia, yes, I know, but hear me out. Quote, an episode of the British TV show QI, or quite interesting, based on hypnosis, host Stephen Fry suggested that he could use subliminal messages to get himself elected as the Pope. The words Stephen Fry for Pope then briefly flashed on the screen. This was repeated later on in the episode, unquote. That's pretty much all there is to this one. Gygus Fetus. So this one is pretty creepy, but it's also probably one of the most well-known in the general online circle of horror slash urban legend video game based stuff. That being said, spoilers for Earthbound ahead. So in the game Earthbound or Mother 2 in Japan, a Super Nintendo J RPG, this is what the final boss looks like. And this is its second form. Now, if you can't see the hidden image, here it is outlined. Yeah, it looks kind of like a fetus, doesn't it? Well, to add to this a little bit of context, allow me to read to you this short article on the Gaming Urban Legends fandom page. Quote, at the end of the game, players notice that the lair of the final boss, the evil alien overlord Gygus, closely resembles a woman's cervix. In addition, in Gygus' final form, he reveals a spiral face, repeatedly endless, in the background, eventually forming the outline of what appears to be a human fetus. The fact that players defeat and kill a boss resembling a fetus after entering what looks like a giant womb has led many to believe that the main protagonists are aborting Gygus in its fetal stage, possibly through time travel. In a 2003 interview, series creator Shigesato Itoi revealed that he based Gygus on a traumatic experience from his childhood. As a young boy, he once accidentally walked into the wrong movie at a movie theater and saw a glimpse of a murder scene from the 1957 Japanese horror film Kinpei to Barabara Shibijin, or in English, the military policeman in the dismembered beauty, which he mistook for a rape scene. This traumatic experience influenced both the design of Gygus and the seemingly incomprehensible dialogue during the battle." Unquote. Now Itoi would later go against this theory by saying that the image was just a coincidence and that none of this was his intention. Which, fair enough. Though I will say on a personal note that even before I had learned of this theory, as a kid I used to love looking up the final bosses of games, just because I was always fascinated with final bosses. And when I first saw Gygus, not only was I really put off by how creepy it was, but also I remember thinking that the design for the second phase was 
a baby. Inside a womb or not, it just simply looks like a baby. And so I always just assumed that was what you were fighting. When I heard about the theory later on, it seemed even more creepy. And then of course, when the creator went ahead and said that that wasn't the case, I mean, yeah, makes sense. Still looks like a baby though. Very interesting coincidence, I must say. But Oh well, it is still nonetheless quite the creepy story. Though I guess if this is supposed to be subliminal, um, it didn't do a very good job at it, did it? <laughs> I mean, I saw it as a kid knowing literally nothing about Earthbound, so yeah, not a very good subliminal message. Slayer, hell awaits, join us. So this is a time when the reversed audio of a song having a secret meaning is actually 100% real. In the song Hell Awaits by the band Slayer, the intro to the song has the band chanting what sounds like reversed audio or just very odd sounds. But when it is reversed, it can clearly be heard that they are saying, join us, as in join them on their way to hell. Again, I would argue that this is closer to an Easter egg, not a subliminal message, but I think that you get the point about my point on that point at this point. Bonus entry, Mario All-Stars SMB1 Underground. So someone suggested this one to me and I feel that you all must see it in this video by Weegeester006. He showcases a piece of subliminal messaging in Mario All-Stars on the Super Nintendo. Pretty crazy, right? Never thought Nintendo would try and pull a fast one on us all like that. And while it could be considered more of an Easter egg, this one really does hedge pretty close with how well hidden it is. Until it's pointed out to you, of course, and then it becomes so blatantly obvious what they are trying to hide here. I mean, look at this shit. Can you believe that you've never seen this before? Fucking wild, dude. Bonus entry. SpongeBob Gary subliminal message. I know in the last part I said I wouldn't be covering all the supposed SpongeBob subliminal messages, uh, but I forgot about this one, which was a case when the show itself acknowledged subliminal messages. I am now going to assault your mind with subliminal messages. Sorry you had to see that. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea what the fucking joke was here, but I do know that when I went looking for answers, I found many, many people used to find this image terrifying as children. And in fact, this episode was apparently banned in certain parts of the UK for a time because of this, along with the don't drop the soap joke earlier on in the episode. Some people have also claimed that this subliminal message is another joke about not dropping the soap, which fair enough enough, but it does seem a little bit random of an image to go alongside that being the joke. Maybe it was just meant to be surreal and confusing on purpose, and furthermore, making fun of the whole subliminal message thing by being so surreal and confusing that when people try to find the answer, they have to come to a realization that it doesn't mean anything. But at any rate, what's next? Food Network McDonald's Flash Ad. Favorite show at the time, the Iron Chef America show, 11 and 12. And then, of course, McDonald's is a big sponsor for this. Now I'm just going to play. Although the Iron Chef offerings were definitely dazzling, it seems the judges preferred the beating they received at the hands of avant garde gastronomer Amar Kantu and his very big. Oh, did you see it? If not. There it was again. Now let's go slow mo this time. Alright. And we're gonna go at 115th. So we're seeing every single frame right now. Uh, 
And I'll move my camera around so you know I'm not photoshopping this or anything. Alright. It'll come in a second. Here it comes. Ooh, a single frame of TV. McDonald's. Yeah, this one is kind of suspect. When inquired about this apparent subliminal image, Food Network spokesperson Mark O'Connor would later say that it was a technical error that showed this flash of an image, and it has been corrected in all future airings. Meanwhile, a McDonald's spokesperson adds that we don't do subliminal advertising. So yeah, maybe it was just a technical glitch that showed this image. Or maybe it was actually a little bit of subliminal messaging since yet again, if it was real, then I doubt anyone involved would be like, uh, yeah, mate, uh, we were trying to brainwash our audience. Sorry about that one. Krispy Kreme, so good, you'll suck up well. Yeah. Once again, this comes from a TV clip on NBC Augusta, in which this showed up. All right, thanks a lot, Liz. And as you heard, some restaurants, including here in Augusta, aren't looking at giving you more low calorie options, even when it comes to donuts. Apparently, this was a rather funny case of the news channel taking an image from Google Images and not reading the fine print of the picture before using it on their channel. Man, somebody must have gotten fired for that, surely. But, um, then again, I have a feeling that whoever did this probably did read the fine print and just wanted to play a sly little joke on the channel. Maybe he knew his days were numbered, or maybe he thought no one would notice, but who knows. Who can resist the gentle touch of palm olive? So, the subliminal message with this one is in this image of this woman taking a shower, her right arm appears to be rather manly looking, implying that either A, there's a man off screen at a very suggestive but also awkward angle, B, it's meant to represent the idea that men won't be able to resist you if you use this product, or C, she just has a really manly looking arm. Which, fair enough I suppose. It could just be the way the light is bouncing off of her arm, but it could also be a male's arm here. I don't fucking know. Looney Tunes by Bonds. Now this one is just straight up as overt as one could possibly get, and also 100% real. In the 1943's Looney Tunes short, Wise Quacking Duck, Daffy Duck at one point is moving a statue, and right there on his shield is clearly written, by Bonds. Now if this seems a little bit random, then you might not be aware of just how many World War II related cartoons and general content that Warner Bros was doing during during World War II. In fact, while this was a much more subtle but still pretty overt use of subliminal messaging, you also do have the Looney Tunes shorts where they just make their stance explicitly clear. The tall man with the high hat will be coming down your way. Get your savings out when you hear him shout, any bonds today? Any bonds today? Bonds of freedom, that's what I'm selling. Any Many stamps today, give kitties, we'll be blessed if we all invest in the USA. Sammy. So yeah, just in case there was any doubt, I think that pretty much puts it to bed. It really does make you wonder if they're already making cartoons where the Looney Tunes are singing about the glory of buying war bonds, why would they also do subliminal messages? I guess just to really try and get the point across and brainwash people? It's a strange thing to do. Speaking of strange things, bonus entry. Ask about Illuminati. So, this is one that I heard about while researching some of the other entries on this iceberg, and I think it is particularly peculiar. In the 88th episode of DuckTales, Yuppie Ducks, there is a scene where Scrooge McDuck is at his doctor's office, and in the background there is an eye chart in Dr. Von Swine's clinic that reads, Ask about Illuminati 
Illuminati thug boys, as shown here. Considering this came out during a time when people were especially looking for Disney-related subliminal messaging, this is quite overt. So much so that you might even consider it a joke, but even still, it's clear as day right there in the episode. This is either a clear case of subliminal messaging being used, or it's completely unknown why the animators would have had the chart say this. A few seconds later in the same episode, the eye chart is then amended to instead read as the more nonsensical Ask a Illuminatum Twig Boys, and then further amended again later to read Ask about Illuminate Tog Boys, which is again quite bizarre. I feel like this one is pretty compelling honestly, but what do you guys think? Do you have any other theories as to why this would be here? Do you think it was just a joke put there by one of the animators? Is it a subliminal message or something else that I've not thought of? JJ Villard's Fairy Tales Bloody Text. JJ Villard's Fairy Tales is a dark comedy animated show that came on Adult Swim in 2020. I've not seen the show myself, but from what I've gathered, it's sort of a retelling of classic fairy tales with a much darker or weird, cynical edge. Well, throughout the six episodes of the show, there is a ton of exorcist-style subliminal messages that pop up on screen for just a split second. While I won't show them all, a few select examples are texts that read, It's okay to give up on your dreams. Crying session at Pinocchio's house, 8 p.m., pull up. Trust gets you killed. Love gets you hurt. And being real gets you hated. And, yeah... There are various other messages like that that all sort of have the same cynical, the world is cruel, you're going to die, nothing matters sort of nihilistic attitude. There are also several instances of subliminal images being shown as well, such as with this witch being carried off by grim reapers, I guess, this monster with a bow on its head, what I'm gonna assume to be the big bad wolf, this clown on a truck that says your life is a joke, etc. I'm not sure if these messages hold any deeper meaning to the show itself, or if they're just random images meant to get people talking about the show, or really what else there could possibly be, but either way, it's somewhat of a more recent and kind of interesting example of something like this being done. The Young Ones Flash Frames So in the early 1980s British sitcom The Young Ones, there were several occasions when quick images would flash on screen as shown here, such as a dub or a frog jumping or a water faucet. Stuff that had nothing to do with the plot of the episode or seemingly anything else. This however was a joke that the creators put in both as an easter egg for longtime fans to find since this show was apparently so popular that people would watch all six episodes of the first season in what they called Young One Nights on VHS. And what's more is this was also done to mock those who were claiming subliminal messages were warped slash brainwashing people's minds. This being a cheeky little way to poke fun at that whole discussion, as well as be varying character for the show itself since it often dipped into surrealism and nonsensical plot points. Thus, if such a show had subliminal messages, they too would be nonsensical. Irreversible Low Frequency Background Noise Irreversible is a 2002 film that is about the events of one traumatic night in Paris Paris, unfolded in reverse chronological order, as the beautiful Alex is brutally, hmm, and beaten by a stranger in an underpass tunnel. So it's a pretty heavy movie, needless to say. In fact, while I've never actually watched the movie myself, I do know and have heard about it uh, being quite infamous. Well, during the first half of the movie, a low frequency sound is played as background noise that was reported to be inducing feelings of nausea, sickness, and vertigo which, you know, uh, probably didn't help with what was visually going on in the film either. If you're curious about the sound being used, I'm going to go ahead and play a small snippet of it here. Uh, bear in mind that you're going to need a good pair of headphones to even hear it, but just in case you're scared, here's the time code for when the audio is going to stop playing, or if you're super brave and you want to actually listen to the whole thing in full, I'll have a link down below to a video by Darcia Owens which showcases the track and you can see for yourself if the audio seems to make you feel sick or queasy or anything else after prolonged listening.
After listening to it myself, I can say it's definitely a very weird feeling I get while listening to it. Not really sick, but just the way it vibrates in my ears kind of puts me on edge. It's sort of like I'm waiting for the jump scare to happen, but it never happens. So it's, uh, it's just not... It's not a good feeling, I'll give it that. I'm not so sure if this is a subliminal message, so much as it is an artistic choice to immense the viewer into the film in a very visceral way, but it is at the very least uh, pretty interesting all the same. Oh fuck, I'm probably gonna not say this right, but whatever. Instituto de Estudos Orientas. Instituto de Estudos Orientas is a Brazilian nonprofit organization with Without any politically uh, partisan commitments. It is funded through contributions by its members and companies that support its mission to build a freer and more a prosperous society, according to its description on Wikipedia. And this is what their logo looks like. Now, uh, what does this look like to you? Would it be a building in front of a red sun? Or does it look a bit like someone shoving something up a big red ass? Well, either way, their logo would uh, evidently be changed to something more suitable later on. Many Islands Low Fares. Spirit Airlines had this ad campaign going for a while with images like these. Return of the MILF, Many Islands Low Fares, which is, uh, well, I mean, it's pretty obvious what the joke is here. I'm not even sure you could call this one subliminal. More like a sort of sly, raunchy joke for anyone who happens to know what this word means. But yeah, bonus entry. Satanism in Pokemon. I'm just gonna let this one play out for a minute or so. Pokemon. Pocket Monster. The Spiral. And it stands for what? male fertility. It's supposed to be able to mesmerize and hypnotize its enemies. This character over here is called Mewtwo. Every time that you see Mewtwo, he's in this pose. Three fingers. It means Hail Satan. Cute little one. Everybody, okay, everybody go. Oh, come on. His tail. It's a lightning bolt. And it's a satanic Z. The Pokemon trading card game is a new collectible card game that is made and distributed by Wizards of the Coast. What is a wizard? Male practitioner of black magic. Cute little Pokemon. Can we agree on that? Yes. Oh, I know he's cute, isn't he? Little satanic tail. Let the camera get a view of that. These pocket monsters are creatures that inhabit the world with humans. Gotta catch them all. You don't need mom. You don't need dad. You don't need grandparents, you don't need aunts and uncles, you don't need school, and you probably don't even need a church. Because you're a master. This rap song that's played over again. And it says, I will travel across the land searching far and wide, each Pokemon to understand the power that's inside. And then it's enchanted to them. Gotta catch them all. Here's the next character, this is Misty. Look at this. If this was actually clear, you'd see that that's a halter top. It stops right there and she's got short shorts on. She's headstrong and stubborn, constantly arguing with Ash. Typical woman. <laughs> God forgive me, all right. <laughs> Jesse, and the other one's called James. And listen to what it says about them. It says, prepare for trouble, make it double. Jesse and James are an evil gang looking to steal rare Pokemon. In the program, they're also prone to cross-dressing. Yeah, that satanic panic stuff was truly something fucking wild. Seeing the devil in every detail these sorts could find. Ironically enough, weakening their own words. And by their logic, God's words. With each new thing that they would condemn, I suppose the devil truly always is in the details. ourselves on the final tier of this iceberg. 
with our next entry, Kill and Sex, written in Gaddafi's face. So this one has to do with Time Magazine's cover of Gaddafi, the once dictator of Libya before being killed by rebels in 2011. This Time Magazine features a painted portrait of Gaddafi, which has been claimed to have the words kill and sex written on his face. If you can't see the supposed messages, well, then here they are written out. Now, are these really subliminal messages? I don't fucking know. I mean, when it comes to a painting, it feels as though you could stare at them forever and find ways for the shadows and lights and brush strokes to spell out whatever you really want. Here's an example. The word Sonic is written on this painting. Don't see it? Well, here it is. Eh? Eh? See what I mean? So while this is rather ominous, especially since this was painted before Gaddafi was targeted and killed, I'm not so sure about the legitimacy of this one. Though I should note that there actually is a another Time Magazine cover where people also did find the words kill and sex on it, but, um, well, when you put that one on, it feels like even more of a stretch to me personally, but I'll let you guys be the judge of that. BTK Killer, now call the chief. Dennis Lynn Raider is an American serial killer known as BTK, an abbreviation he gave himself for bind, torture, kill. Between 1974 and 1991, he killed 10 people in Wichita and Park City, Kansas, and sent taunting letters to police and newspapers describing the details of his crimes in a similar fashion to the infamous Zodiac Killer. Dennis would walk into people's homes in broad daylight, deal with whoever was in his way, and would then strangle the woman of the house. The whole thing fulfilling a sick sort of pleasure for him that he developed from a very young age. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Dennis didn't actually have a bad childhood that's typical of his kind from what we know. The only thing that was going against him was his parents not really paying him much mind, not giving him the attention that he so craved. But it doesn't stop there. What's even more creepy is Dennis worked in a Wichita-based office of ADT, security services from 1974 to 1988, where he installed security alarms as part of his job, in many cases for homeowners concerned about the BTK killings. In other words, he set up security systems for the very people who wanted to keep him out. He was also quite bold, with at one point calling the police on the phone at the scene of his own crime right after having done it, being sure to get the credit that he thought he also deserved, as his twisted need for attention was seemingly endless. Well, in 1978, Wichita, Kansas television Cake TV received special permission from the police to place a subliminal message in a report on the BTK killer in an effort to get him to turn himself in. The subliminal message included the text, now call the chief, as well as a pair of glasses. The glasses were included because when BTK murdered Nancy Fox, there was a pair of glasses laying upside down on her dresser. Police felt that seeing the glasses might stir up remorse in the killer. This, however, didn't work, and in fact, there was no uptick in calls regarding the case, so no one else was brainwashed into calling the police chief either. Wow, who could have predicted that? But this happening at all does reveal that at the time there was some level of legitimacy that many, including the police, put into the idea of subliminal messages working. Dennis would later be caught when he started writing a ton of letters to the police around 2004-2005, 14 years after his last killing, and he asked them in one of the letters if floppy disks could be traced. The police, of course, said no because why the fuck would they tell the truth to a fucking serial killer? And when Dennis sent them a floppy disk, they were able to recover a deleted Word document that tied directly to his name and the church that he was a part of. And after testing Dennis's daughter's DNA for a match, yeah, they, they got him. The floppy did him in. I guess for as crafty as he was, he was quite Quite apparently a dinosaur when it came to understanding technology. Dennis, funnily enough, even feeling betrayed that the police had lied to him, <laughs> which is just uh, 
if you, you, you just can't make that shit up. He's currently still alive in prison, serving 10 consecutive life sentences before he makes the big old transition to his eternity sentence in hell. Judas Priest's song triggered a self-exit of life event. Better by you, better than me, is a song originally made in 1969 uh, by the English rock band Spooky Tooth and would later be covered in 1978 by heavy metal band Judas Priest. Well, in 1990, Judas Priest were involved in a civil action that alleged they were responsible for the 1985 self-exit of life attempts of 20-year-old James Vance and 18-year-old Ray Belcap in Reno, Nevada, USA. On the 23rd of December 1985, Vance and Belcap became intoxicated before going to a playground at a Lutheran church in Reno. Belcap placed a 12-gauge shotgun under his own chin and proceeded to fire the weapon, dying instantly. Vance followed, but survived the self-inflicted gunshot wound with a severely disfigured face. He would then go on to die three years later. This was obviously truly, truly terrible and beyond tragic. But what made it all the worse is Vance's parents and their legal team would then allege that a subliminal message of do it had been included in the song. They alleged that the command in the song triggered the terrible event. What followed was a three-week trial to which was watched closely by many as if it were to be judged as true. It would set a terrible precedent for both the music industry as well as art in general as the only solution would be censorship and walking on eggshells to such a degree that honestly art in general could be in trouble for being blamed for, well, anything bad that happens, which people already tend to do, of course, but there would be some legal precedent to make it a court win should someone start a lawsuit over it. In the end, though, the case was dismissed with the finding that any subliminal messages within the recording, should they actually exist, were not responsible for the self-exits of life. It's almost always a tragedy when someone extinguishes their life. And when such an event should occur, oftentimes people are searching for an answer to a heart-wrenching question of why. And often, this is how boogeymen are created from thin air, such as in this particular case. And perhaps in some ways, you might say subliminal messages sort of represent a boogeyman in general, something that is unseen, thought to be found in the shadows of other things, but has no apparent victims to its name, yet is feared nonetheless. AARP 2015 Commercials So there's this PSA by by AARP, where this mom gets up off her seat and goes and dries her kid's hair with a towel. And there's some very low audio on her TV that, well, I'll show you the footage with the sound boosted with what is being said shown on screen real quick. Now, what the hell is this all about? What makes this one extra creepy is that it is involved with the Ad Council, with this tied closely with the federal government, which makes the implications of this subliminal message far more sinister. As far as I can tell, there's two ways of interpreting this. Someone who was making this commercial put this audio in as a joke, or this is at least an attempt at a subliminal message that is connected directly with the US federal government about martial law, which uh, I'm not gonna get into all that, but needless to say, that would be a bad, very bad thing. You know, it's the intention that really makes this all so very creepy. And we unfortunately have no way of truly knowing what the actual intentions are. Like all these subliminal messages could be totally 100% real and just so happen to have not fucking worked at all because duh, of course they didn't fucking work. But is the idea that these companies slash governments are using them with the intent of brainwashing you, or at least using the public as lab rats to see if 
they can brainwash you. It is truly the scarier idea. If someone gave you a cup that they assumed was filled with poison, but it just so happened to be apple juice, well, I mean, of course, you can kind of laugh about it and be like, well, that was just fucking apple juice, so... I'm fine, but then you gotta like stop and look over at that guy that just gave you the apple juice and think, man, you're just like thinking I was gonna die and you were okay with that. Are are we cool? National Anthem 1960s TV sign-off. So this one's about a 1960s National Anthem TV sign-off, as you might have guessed, but with subliminal messages throughout it, such as, trust the US government, God is real, God is watching, believe in government God, rebellion will not be tolerated, obey, consume, obey, consume, buy ultra, buy Naomi, worship, consume, obey, believe, do not question government. Government. Now, several people have pointed out that the original uploader of this video, Naomi, 1963-1963, uh, back in 2009, the description says nothing of the subliminal messages that are in the video, despite the user's name so clearly being referenced within it. Now, here's the part where I ask you guys for help. I remember a few years back, somebody here on YouTube, I'm almost sure it was either Scare Theater or Blame It on Jorge, but I've looked through the video catalog and I can't seem to find this video, but somebody like that made a video about this video and channel and provided some pretty good evidence for why it's most likely fake. That video has stuck out in my mind and was what I immediately thought of when I first saw this entry on the iceberg. However, in looking for that video, I've found no luck. I'm unsure if it was deleted or maybe if it was made by someone else that I just can't remember, but if any if anyone else remembers that video and would like to point me in the right direction of it, I'd be quite thankful. That being said, this one, the actual subliminal message in the video here, is pretty well considered to be fake. But it's not totally out of the ball of possibility though, since when others tried to find a different copy of that National Anthem TV sign-off from someone else to see if it would also have subliminal messages, they did find that the different version of the sign-off didn't have subliminal messages. However, the image of that particular unaltered video is cropped, implying that the video with the subliminal messages is the original, or at the very least, the version with the cropped edges is different from the one that we have here, meaning we haven't found an exact copy of this 1960s TV sign-off. Either way though, it's most likely fake, especially the weird font changes and some other effects that don't really add up at all. Again, I remember the video that I'm referencing before might have actually like scanned the video through something and like went in really deep and found that the effects on the subliminal messages just seemed too modern like it was done with a video editor nowadays rather than something that they had back then, uh, but I can't find that video for reference. So just take my word for it and if anyone happens to know where it is, let me know. But all the same, this is still quite creepy. Bonus entry, Bored Apes Yacht Club. This entry was suggested by my Arch Owl patron, just us. And my god, is this an entire rabbit hole of crazy shit all in of itself. Now, I do need to be careful and note here that this topic is kind of all over the place, and the biggest video about it on this website has, for all intents and purposes, been shadow banned. As it's nearly impossible to search it up on YouTube by itself, you'll, you'll find like a bunch of reaction videos to this video, but the actual video itself is rather difficult to find, meaning that there is some level of censorship going on here. Though it should be noted that that's probably not because YouTube is like, I don't know, looking out for cryptocurrency companies or Nazis or something is probably because the title of the video is called the Bored Ape Nazi Club, which yeah, anything with not seen the title is going to be shadow banned on YouTube. So yeah, that's probably why it's not showing up in the search results. 
But nonetheless, I can't really go into all the details of this rabbit hole, but the broad strokes are, you know the bored monkey NFTs everybody was talking about for fucking months? You know, they look like shit and whatever? Well, the creators of this NFT chain seem to have created them with the express purpose of trolling in mind, with Nazi imagery slash symbolism being used in nearly all their branding, including this quite interesting piece of evidence the Bored Ape Yacht Club logo being an ape version of the Nazi SS logo. It's nearly identical in style, logo placement, etc. The fact that it actually took people a little bit to make this connection is a little funny, but also really fucking crazy. The apes themselves are also seemingly supposed to be racist caricatures, and they had this whole ARG thing that was also tied into the Nazi philosophy. It's an overwhelming amount of evidence, honestly, to the point that it would have to be some kind of out-of-universe coincidence to not be the case. There is more to it, and I would highly suggest watching some of the other videos that go into more depth if you want to know more about it. But yeah, the long and short of it is, the ugly bored ape NFTs were actually created by a bunch of 4chan trolls in order to get the public and celebrities to endorse, buy into, and further propagate and showcase national socialism imagery, all while they get paid a handsome amount of money from the whole thing. It is a subliminal message of sorts, but uniquely made to troll the public and manipulate rich people into endorsing the subliminal message. It's pretty fucking crazy and out there, but now plenty of people know about it, so I suppose their NFT trolling subliminal game is more than likely over. But my god, what a twist. Bonus entry, Sarah Ali's Quran videos. So this one is quite disturbing. There is this channel that goes by Sarah Ali, which had two videos, one titled Quran and the other titled Quran for Sleep, both of which mostly consisted of readings of the Quran. But they there is, of course, a twist to both of these videos. They have subliminal messages in them at points later in the video, when the listener is more than likely asleep. Take a listen to them. Pills easily. I can swallow pills like anybody. I overcome my fear from swallowing pills. I can swallow pills easily. I can swallow pills like anybody. I overcome my fear from swallowing pills. I can swallow pills easily. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is dating. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is talking to. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is dating. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is talking to. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is dating. The relationship between Owen Brown and any woman he is talking to get destroyed. The relationship between Owen Brown and any woman he is dating gets destroyed. Brown is spending the rest of his life with me. Owen Brown is spending the rest of his life with me. Owen Brown is coming back to Oric University for me. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. Yeah, if you couldn't tell, the Owen Brown thing seems to imply that this was very personal. An ultra select subliminal message. Though as YouTuber Gooseboost knows, which by the way is the only way to see these videos since they've been taken down, this seems more than likely to be a strange chant, like dark magic or something. Since Owen Brown is unlikely to actually watch this video, it's more like a strange call to the universe a prayer to manifest these things into reality, which is pretty disturbing given what the messages are. These videos have since been copyright claimed as I noted, as they did have audio from other official readings of the Quran. But overall, it's an interesting case. Makes me wonder if there are any other videos out there with looping for hours worth of audio that randomly turns into subliminal messages or sneaky jokes or something later on. Imagine you're listening to a nice relaxing bit of music to fall asleep to, and five hours into the music, some guy just starts yelling, nightmare, 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 or something like that to try and fucking manifest nightmares in your brain. Boy, oh boy.
That sure would suck. Igor Smirnov slash David Koresh FBI phone calls. While these two entries are separate on this iceberg, as far as I could tell, they are very much connected and are about the exact same event. Now, if you've never heard of or don't know any details about David Koresh, his cult, or the standoff between his cult and the FBI in Waco, Texas, I would highly recommend Wendy Goon's video on the topic. It's the definitive coverage of the story in my books, and pretty well explains all sides of the conflict fairly. Also, there is the Netflix series Waco, which is also pretty good. So if you want to know more about this topic, I'd go watch those first. But for this iceberg entry's sake, all you need to know is that David Koresh was a cult leader. His cult were known as the Branch Davidians. They lived in a compound in Waco, and there were some shady shit going on in that compound. But, shockingly enough, the FBI were doing, arguably, even more shady shit on the outside, which led to a gunfight and a standoff between the two groups that was heavily televised and lasted for 51 days. The FBI wanted this whole thing to end as quickly as possible, and the whole thing was going on for far too long. And during a sizable portion of the siege, the FBI were on the phone with David Koresh and some of his followers, as negotiations went on for some time. Well, the FBI tried various forms of negotiation negotiation to get this whole thing settled. Well, up to a point. Again, watch Wendy Goon's video for more context, but let's just say that the FBI desperately wanted and maybe needed a win at this point as the public perception of them was at an all-time low. This would eventually lead to forms of psychological torture to get the Branch Davidians to crack being used by the FBI, which given what the FBI claimed they were afraid of happening, that being a mass self-exit of life event, this was more than a dangerous game they were playing. This was almost asking for that result, actually. This included playing loud screaming, buzzing, and oddly enough, dolphin noises late into the night so that no one in the compound, including the many children in there, could get any sleep. This finally leads into our subliminal messages. Igor Smirnov is a controversial Russian scientist best known for his role in Soviet era mind control research, as well as an obscure field of human behavior study he called psychoecology. He was a rather interesting character, shall we say, as well. He was often characterized by the media as a Rasputin-like character, with almost mystical powers over persuasion. According to his wife, Ralsukina, the Soviet military enlisted Smirnov's psychotechnology in the 1980s to combat the, I'm gonna probably get this fuck up Mujahideen and treat post-traumatic stress syndrome in Russian soldiers during the war in Afghanistan. Smirnov founded the Psychotechnology Research Institute of the People's Friendship University of Russia, my god that's a long name, to work on ideas like psychocorrection, a term he used to denote the use of subliminal messages to alter a subject's will or even modify a person's personality without their knowledge. Well, bearing all that fun, 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 fun stuff in mind, the FBI actually consulted Smirnov regarding the Waco siege at the time. Smirnov proposed piping subliminal messages from sect members' families through the phone lines during negotiations so as to psychologically control and manipulate a surrender out of David Koresh. There might have also been talk of using the voice of God to have a similar effect on David. However, the FBI ended up not going through with that plan. Ironically enough, this probably wouldn't have worked at all and would have been one of the far less dangerous ideas they would have tried, especially given what actions they did take, which led to the deaths of so, so many children in the final day of that standoff undiscovered subliminal messages slash the darker truth. So for our final entry of this iceberg, we are left with the idea that perhaps the darkest and maybe even the most successful subliminal messages have been the ones we've yet to, or perhaps may never discover. However, I'd also like to touch on a consistent theme throughout this entire iceberg, that of free will. The truth is most of these subliminal messages, whether they be real, fake, a joke, 
joke, an easter egg, regardless. There isn't really any proof that any of these supposed subliminal messages had any sort of impact on anyone's mind. For as much power as some give them, it seems sort of like a dated idea at this point, right? I suppose someone who deeply believes in subliminal messages, abilities over our minds, have plenty of arguments for how we would never truly know what impact they have on our minds because why would they dare tell the truth and how could we truly know if it was done subconsciously which i believe is an interesting rabbit hole because when you create a concept with endless possibilities it almost becomes impossible to truly debunk because the very idea is that when it's theoretically working you would never see it sort of similar to the matrix idea that we're all living inside a simulation you could find a million reasons for why this isn't the case as well as a million reasons for why this is the case. But ultimately, it all just sort of adds up to nothing and everyone's just talking in circles. It's more of an interesting philosophical idea than it is an actual reality thing. This connects with what I believe to be the true horror of subliminal messages, why people are so interested in them or scared of them. Because they are the old fear that our actions are meaningless, that our own choices aren't our own, that something, perhaps someone sinister, is secretly controlling us, pulling the strings without us ever knowing. To believe in subliminal messages is to believe that we either have no true free will or that it can easily be manipulated without our knowing. I think this is why religious groups often bring up the devil being behind this whole thing. Because in essence, it would be the perfect mockery of God's creation, gifted with free will, yet so easily manipulated, controlled rather. In this scenario, the devil would be proving that humans' greatest gift, free will, is meaningless and so easily taken away. Unlike the serpent convincing Eve to eat the fruit of knowledge, this would cut far, far deeper. But of course, you don't even have to approach this from a religious standpoint. You can just come from it from a point of, do you believe your actions and your thoughts are your own? Do you believe that your actions, your accomplishments, your failures, your dreams, the very words that stream through your brain, the images that you come up with, the choices that you make for yourself and those around you, do you believe that those are your own? Because if you do, then subliminal messages so too make a mockery of this notion that you can somehow be manipulated through literal microseconds of an image or a word being showcased. I think we all have this fear of a greater evil in the shadows, fear of the unknown, not just of its matter, but of its intentions. However, true Truth be told, the government, the media, how people in your own life already have other far, far more easy ways of manipulating others. They can do it through their emotions, through false information, through the lens by which they tell stories, all of which are things that can be used to actively shape your and others' perception of reality. And this is not something that is hidden. It is right in front of us all. And most of us don't even think twice about it. And even those that do know that there will always be those that will allow themselves to be manipulated. Now I ask you this, when we live in such a reality, what use are subliminal messages when good old propaganda is so much more effective? But that's just some food for thought. But all the same, subliminal messages are at least a pretty interesting idea. That words and images being flashed on screen can shape our everyday decisions. But I for one, believe that subliminal messages are but only shadows of something far, far more real and perhaps far, far more scary to have to deal with. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for the Sabluno Message Iceberg. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons and YouTube members, including all of my night eggs and night owlets, and a very special thank you to all of my great night owls, including Forgotten Ace, Macabre Kaiju, Medusa's Hex, and Ho Hot. 
And then a super duper special thank you to all of my arch owls, including the Good Chi Vibe Zen Garden Party, the Symphonic Just Us, the Spooky Sassel Jump Scares Lore Master, Doggy and GT, and the marvelous Maximus Brime. Until next time, this has been a Dylan the Night Owl flying off.